Hello everybody. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Here we are again. We are ready for today's uh, encounter. Please go invite your friends. Go invite your friends and family. We are, we are supposed to have Obasi, uh, Don, Don, what's his name, Don, is it? No, no, he has a name, Pedro, okay, Don Pedro Obaseki is who we are supposed to have, but since we didn't have uh, innocent conversation with an atheist uh, last, uh, last week, or uh, yesterday also, we didn't have it last week, we didn't have it yesterday, so we decided to go for that today. So Innocent, over to you, sir. All right, thank you so much, DSC, and uh, apologies to to the people that have been expecting. I think it was last week, Sunday, and then this Sunday again, most of them were expecting to see us come online to talk, but I received a lot of messages, inbox of people they were talking about like, what happened, why couldn't you come? So here we are today, eventually, and I hope you will go back to see some of the messages. I don't know why it happened that way. Obasiki is not here today, so we'll go on with the program. So I got a lot of messages, inbox, so many messages encouraging, so many questions. Some of the questions are repetitive, so I just cancel some of them. Then that's what I noticed. And some of those questions have been addressed through the previous interview that we had in the past. So I encourage most of us to go back and search some of the interviews. And if you notice the pattern we have been following, if I understand very clearly, somebody sent me a message too recently about that, that Christianity, how to try to see how Christianity can be used, uh, how Christianity can be applied both economically, both politically, but socially, how it governs our life. So this has been part of the debate. Many people are claiming that Christianity is outdated. That uh, example of a text that somebody just sent to me, I would like to read it quickly to you. Okay, okay before I do that, let me read some of the comments that people shared, if you permit me, with your, yeah, with your permission, please. Go ahead, please. Okay. I have three, three commentaries here. The other person said, the first one is, you say, I believe by the end of this series, DSA will lead this innocent guy to Christ. <laughs> that, that's the first comment he said. So the second person said, this guy sharp will say you become a very strong weapon of converting souls to Christ like Saul. I pray for you. Continue. <laughs> so this thought person, I was very skeptical. I, I Because the message is a little bit mixed. I don't know, is it positive, negative? But then I thought about you the last time we talked, you you say you should bring everything on that you can handle it. I also replied this very individual that sent this commentary. I, I tried to make certain things clear, but let me just read it out and I'll allow you to comment on that so that it, things will be clear. The person said, say, I watched your interview with DSA. You did well. I observed that you have a very patient and a calm personality. If given the opportunity to talk with him, I don't think I can exercise your restraint. He got some historical and scientific facts all mixed up, but you were calm and really engaging. That's what the person said. Then the person went further to say, but here is the interesting part about him. I went on to make some research on the man you're interviewing. He's a very intelligent man. He seemed to be really progressive. And considering the lives he has positively affected, I will give him a go above all the so-called men of God in Nigeria. I also find it extremely hard to believe that he also believes his response to all your questions. He strikes me to be a highly intellectual person. In fact, I think he is secretly an atheist in denial. That's what this person is saying. So I read it, I, I don't know, the, the, it's mixed both positive and negative, and so I, I then replied, okay, let me, let me allow you to comment on that before I share my reply with, to the person. No, no, I am okay. Go ahead and continue. Okay, so that also, that's the end of the person's uh, comment. No, no more comments, right? 
no comment yes. So you want me to comment on this? Yes, yes. They, they, because this person made some claims. If you first of all think there were some historical and scientific mixed up in some of the fact you gave, he's talking about based on the previous uh, interview, he didn't point out which specifically is, is mixed up. Then he went on to say he found you really interesting. He thinks you are an intellectual person. And then he's also happy about the positive impact you have had in people's life. And then he also went on to claim that he thinks he is secretly an atheist in denial. <laughs> so, yeah, that, I, I think the whoever the person is, yes. I think if the person is saying that I got some scientific and historical facts mixed up, I think uh, the person himself, first of all, the fact that he, don't, he didn't indicate yes. the facts that he's talking about he's not supposed to be taken serious. He's just making charges and allegations or just making wide statement. Goose wide run in the bush. So no, you know, nothing to pay attention to there. Uh, because if you know, he doesn't know me very well, maybe. Uh, even if I don't, I'm not very uh, sure of any fact. That's, I would say that I'm not sure of it. But the point itself that I'm making will always be accurate. Uh, it's a pity that the person himself cannot come on live discussion. If the person could come on live discussion, I would have liked to have a debate with him so that he himself will tell me whatever he knows. Let him bring all his information. And um, the assumption that the person is having is that only atheists or agnostics uh, possess any form of knowledge or any form of sanity. And uh, that is, either the person is self-delusion, delusioned, or delusional, or the person is uh, being biased against Christians, or the only Christians the person is uh, familiar with is the Christians of Africa, who, who are just the, yeah, the paganistic, you know, syncretistic kind of Christians. That that is the idea of Christianity the person is having. But if the person gets the opportunity to uh, relate with or to even read historical books, he will discover that atheism as a whole is a new uh, is a new occurrence. So it is uh, just in the. Uh, 18th century, people began to declare that they are atheists publicly or they don't believe in God. So uh, it's a new thing. So then, so who do we uh, own all the knowledge that we have all this while to? So people who believe in God, either they believe in their traditional gods or they believe in Christian God or pre-Christian God, but they were not atheists. We don't, we, we don't own all these things to atheists. So it is, it's a, it's, it is a, it's a new occurrence, it's a new development, so that they cannot take credit for, for the human civilization up to now. So we cannot say it is uh, uh, only anybody that is intelligent is, must be an atheist. Yeah, uh, so yeah, it's some kind of biased uh, thinking that the person possesses, I, I, would, I would say. So, uh, and the person is contradicting himself. And it's all the positive things he's saying are, are the total opposite of the initial thing he had said before. So it's not... The person just wants to make some wide, like I said, wide goose run kind of statements. Just throw some big something out there. I think the person must be a lover of control, controversy. Just wants, to, just wants to strike controversy. And that's all. It's just, uh, you know, nothing to be taken serious about the person's comment. Okay. Thanks, sir. I still want to reiterate this to whosoever is listening to us, that the the objective, it has been always, if you follow throughout all the interview, you see that we have one. I don't know if I'm, am I loud enough? Am I clear? You are, yeah, you are loud enough. I'm not loud enough. I think you are okay. loud enough. So the objective is to encourage people to ask questions, and I want to let this clear to many people. Although it's titled Conversation with an Atheist, 
I do not have any problem with the existence of God, as I always refer to it as some form of transcendent energy. The, the bone of contention here is the concept of God that we were trying to question here. So the, the objective is to motivate people, to encourage people to ask questions, to read history of Christianity, to read so many questions. So this very individual that made this commentary again also wrote something recently, I'm just about to read to you now. He said, I'm, I'm not a pale paleontologist. I work in microbiology, but I understand paleontology reasonably well. We understand that there are records of five mass extinctions in geological record. There are also evidence of prehistoric fauna, which today archaeologists have embarked on the recollection of fossils, extensive forensic analysis, and classification of ample DNA data. Now let's look into the glacial period, the Ice Age which started 2.6 million years at the start of Pleistocene epoch and ended just 5,000 years ago. A period where the Earth's surface and the entire atmosphere recorded a very low temperature, resulting in the presence or expansion of continental and polar ice sheets and alpine glaciers. I think this is French. We are currently experiencing an interglacial age, which is commonly known as the greenhouse climate state and scientifically known as the Holocene Epoch. And again, we understand that with the help of scientific apparatus, we are able to predict that the current warm climate might last for another 50,000 years, but can also be largely influenced by climate change. Not to argue too far, there are three major scientific processes involved in the collection of some of the evidence I mentioned above. Firstly, is the geological analysis. Secondly, the chemical deposit. And lastly, the paleontological studies. Can you therefore please explain to us what happened to Polycosaur, some of the cherub seeds, Cretaceous, <laughs> Paleogen, an event or the, or the Permian extinction, also known as the Great Dying. This person is talking about dinosaurs. Tell us why T-Rex and Celiophysis do not show up in the same period in the fossil layer. How did your God fail to reveal extinction of trilobite to his prophet? There are thousands of other examples, but this will do for now. I also want to say this. I clearly understand why things become apprehensive. What I mean by things is religious folks, aka believers. Some of them were also involved as scientists in some of this archaeological adventure. I also understand that it's hard for many religious folks to admit that the so-called holy books missed to mention any of this historical collection. You see, we already know that Christianity, which precedes Judaism and subsequently Islam, and all the 40,000 other religions are nothing but primitive and illogical mass attempts in trying to understand the cosmos. So that this person made mention of dinosaurs and is trying to understand why is it that the Bible never mentioned dinosaurs and some of the huge fossils that are not found. No. In the Bible. Uh, dinosaurs. The Bible mentioned dinosaurs. If you if you uh, look into the book of uh, Job, you will see a reference and a description of dinosaurs actually. So okay. it it is lack of knowledge again that is making this person to think that the Bible never mentioned dinosaurs. And it's, it's, uh, it's mentioned in the book of Job, but uh, then the, the um, archaeological discover discoveries that she's talking about, uh, or he is talking about, and the changes in the Earth atmosphere that, uh, that have been recorded by you know, archaeological discoveries, they, there is nothing new to the Bible about those things. The Bible tells us that uh, uh, there was a period when the earth itself went through uh, destruction. So it could be explained that uh, a lot of the changes that we are seeing now or that have preceded this time uh, happened before our, this present generation we are living in. 
these things probably happened before the the destruction, the destruction of the earth that happened during the time of Noah, and the, you know. But apart from the destruction of the earth of uh, the days of Noah, you know, if you read the Bible very well, you will also see that uh, the earth. It says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness on the face of the deep, was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. It was good. God divided the light. God called the light day and all that. So you could see that it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's not telling us how old, what was the time space that transpired before all the other events that we are seeing right now. Okay, see, for example, if you, you know, I want you to pay special attention to what I'm going to read now. Verse 1 in Genesis says, God created the heavens and the earth, full stop. So how many years elapsed? between that first one, I mean verse one, to the next event that is now being described. Now, when, when the uh, atheists and the scientists challenge the Bible and try to say the Bible doesn't record the age of the earth and that the earth has been, you know, scientifically proven to be over, to be, you know, in the millions of years, that uh, and the earth is, I mean, the Bible is saying it's just 6,000 years or something like that. That's the kind of argument that how can it be? So, why is it I didn't record all these other layers of the earth that has been yeah, recorded to have been for millions of years? But from my own understanding of this scripture, it says God created the heavens and the earth. But when people read this, they keep up, they just run. And keep on reading to the next verse. But if we don't read to the next verse immediately and put a full stop just as, as it is in the Bible, we will see that verse 2 says, and this is where they say the Christ, where they attack the Christians the most, and say the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth, of the deep. Now, you will see that what God did is that he first of all created heaven and the earth. Maybe a million years past, maybe hundred million years past, maybe one billion years past. We don't know. And then he started to walk, not on the universe, because when you see the, the, in the beginning God created heavens and the earth, it is clear that God is talking here about the universe. So God created heaven and the earth. That is the universe in general, including the earth, everything. Then in verse 2, it now started the process of the, you know, the explicit creation of the things in particular on the earth itself. Not the, the, he's not creating the earth all over again. He's putting substance into the earth. So that's why in verse 2 he says, the earth was without form and void. So, but it was there. Only it was without form or void, but it was there. If it was not there, there would be no identity for it. Because it had a name. The earth was without. So it existed. And all those layers, all those, we don't know all the processes that were going on that time. The formulative processes. The movement, the on, on the net. We didn't know what was going on. So all those processes were going on, but nobody could fix them or record them. But until God said, let there be light, and that light is what has now made it possible for scientists also to be able to now do research and discover what had been there all along. We should know that scientists don't create these things they only discover what has been created. Okay. Scientists didn't 
bring it about. They are only telling us that it was there. So who put it there? So that's the whole idea that science can only discover. And tomorrow, science will come again and tell us, oh, we discover another thing. Oh, then we discover another one. Oh, we discover... I cannot base my life on science that is continuously changing. It's made, oh, we thought this before. Now we are thinking, oh, now we know we have more information. Now we have more sophisticated uh, uh, apparatus uh, or equipment that will be able to give us more certain information. And then they will still discover many more things. But the thing I'm saying is that these things this guy is talking about, they are not eating from the Bible. They are right here. And that explains everything that he has been trying to uh, explain uh, or quote to us in that place. Okay. It's, it's interesting what you said because I, I try to do comparative religion to see and you said science evolve, science change constantly, which is I think that that's the dynamics, which is very okay. That's the beauty of science in itself. It yeah, but si yeah today. the beauty of science is that science progresses. That's the beauty of science. But science yeah. also regresses. There is a lot of revisionism, revisionism in mm -hmm. science. What does that mean? That means we used to think before that things were like this, based on the fact that we had. But because we have better facts now, we are changing that old assumption or the old belief system or the old thing that we thought was like that. So which means people have built their lives and their conclusions. So science is telling us today that this is the way the, the, the old thing works. And then when they got more info, get more information and more discoveries, they now come and say, oh no, we are wrong. But there have been hundred generations of people who have died thinking that what you told them was right. And they put their lives on that. And that could have been the reason why they went to hell. So it is the revisionism of science that I am saying I cannot base my life on. Not on the progressiveness of it. Okay. That is a different, that, that's a two way to look at it. Okay. What was, what, 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 science is, okay. That, that, that's, that's okay. Uh, do you think God changes his mind? God? If he changes his mind. Does God change his mind? Yes. Um, I will not put it that way. Because God is a God that knows the beginning from the end. And knows the end from the beginning. So I will not say he changes his mind. I will say he changes his decisions, but not his mind. Well, the difference, decision and mind is... Yes, changing his mind means changing his mind could invo involve changing his value system or changing his conclusions or changing his worldview. He doesn't. But it could change his decision. He could say, for example, uh, I want you... I decided to punish you for this because you are you you know uh, because you are not going to repent or believe in him, so you are going to hell. But once you repent and believe in him, you do the right thing. He said, "Okay, you are no more going to hell. You are going to heaven." For example, so changing the decision, but it's not changing his mind in the sense that uh, his you know paradigm is not changing. Okay. You know when we when we talk about people changing their mind. If I say I change my mind about something, it means that I used to believe like this, and now I change my mind. I believe in a different way. That involves the change of paradigm, and that involves worldview. But when I say I change my decision, it's di totally different from changing my worldview altogether. I'm trying to reconcile that intricate. I'm a linguistic student, but I find it hard to wrap my head around it. Decision and mind. With the explanation you just gave seems plausible. It's something I describe in philosophy as sophistry. You know, you 
to handle it in a very pretty way. So it's okay. We can we can do that. I hope many people still get it, get the point. Okay, so you, I can I can explain what I message. Oh, okay, please please please. please. Okay, for example, change my mind. I could I say I I used to believe that there was no God, and I changed my mind. I believe there is God now. So that is a two different opposite uh, direction things. So that is involving paradigm and worldview. But when I say I, I want to go out at 11 o'clock, but no, I've, I'm no more going at 11 o'clock, but I will go at uh, 1 o'clock. That is just changing decision, but not, it doesn't affect paradigm. No paradigm involved here. No word view involved here. It's just decision. Okay. So, if the, the, the question is, if, if, if God is omniscience, which means all-knowing God, why would he change his decision? On what, on what basis? Can you, can you, oh, oh, yeah. Explain? Just like I said now, if God said, for example, this person is going to die because he's been disobedient to God, and then the person repented, and God said, okay, you will not die anymore because of the decision you just made. You will not die. You will leave. So in that case, for example, God has changed his decision, but he had not changed his own concept of worldview. So God okay. doesn't change his worldview. He doesn't change his mind in terms of worldview because it's omniscience and, you know, omnipresent and all-knowing. And, you know, he was there in the beginning and he's, you know, uh, you know, he knows the beginning from the end. He knows the end from the beginning. So he cannot change that sense. Okay. He can change his decision, but not change his mind. If I understand clearly from the example we just gave now, it seems very clear for me. It seems as if it's not actually God's decision, it's the man's decision. He chooses where yes. he wants to go, yes. whether he wants to go to hell or heaven. Yes. So God that doesn't is, have... That is in that particular example. For okay. example, there could be another example. It might not be that example. It could be, for example, uh, another uh, example of how God could change his decision, for example. For example, uh, uh, God said... Uh, I wanted to destroy the whole earth, I mean, of Sodom and Gomorrah, for example. God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham came and said, uh, you know, he started negotiating with God and started saying, can you have mercy if you find... And God said, okay, I will not destroy the country if we have 10 people there that will be righteous. So God took this, this he changed his decision but he didn't quite change his worldview or what he wanted. He still ended up de destroying the place. But if they are going, if they were going to find more than ten people there, for example, he wouldn't do it. So he's not changing his principles of taking decisions, his or his worldview, but he's just changing his decision in a, in in accordance to the response of people he's dealing with or the people, you know. Because he is, God is also letting man participate in the process of decision making. So it's not just being robotic and saying that I'm God. And so that's what I'm saying, that God is not you know, a tyrannic God or a dictator. So he's giving room for people to also, uh, you know, take their, you know, influence or decide what will happen uh, to them eventually. So it's okay. very close to what you said that uh, uh, God, uh, you know, is my is not man's God's decision; it's man's decision. So, but not that is just because of the examples we are using. But there might be different other examples. For example, uh, mm, for that we don't know the reason why God will change His decisions. For example, it's, let's say God. Would like the end to come to the, the world to come to an end, and he wanted the end the world to come to an end one thousand two thousand years after the death of Jesus or one thousand years after the death of Jesus. But for reasons best known to him, he changes his mind, he changes his decision that the, the, the earth will still come to an end, but not one thousand years after Jesus, maybe two thousand years after. It might be dependent on men's reaction 
or it might not be dependent on mind's reaction. There might be a lot of undercurrent things that we don't know. We are too small compared to all the things that God knows. So, what, what, why will God change His decision? For what reason? Why will He do that? Only to the benefit of man and to the benefit of His own uh, purposes. Okay. We have a lot of Christians sending in their questions here. This person particularly wants to understand why God created man in the first place. God created man in the first place because God intended to create a miniature of heaven. He wanted to duplicate himself and duplicate the heaven. So, uh, heaven is what we call the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is where everything runs and functions in perfection. No cries there, no tears, no pain, no sorrow, no darkness, no evil. So, it's a good place. Now, when God decided to create a duplication of the kingdom of God, or which we call heaven, he, put that, he decided to put that heaven on the earth. Now, apart from the earth, we have many other planets and galaxies. But he shows the earth to, to be the place where this duplication or miniature of heaven or miniature of the kingdom of God will be placed. And that, kingdom, that miniature kingdom of God was supposed to start from a particular spot because that's the principle of God God starts small and everything he starts small grows to eventually be big so God started I mean put the miniature of heaven to start from a place that is called the Garden of Eden the Garden of Eden is not a geographical understanding as such but it is more of a, a location that is determined by the presence of the kingdom of God. So let's say the earth, uh, let's say the old earth is this room. And, but the kingdom of God is put in a particular spot. So it's still the earth, but the kingdom of God, so the earth is still like it is today, for example, just without Satan, or without that, without other things. But he put the, 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 the miniature of the kingdom of heaven in the garden. So the assignment, the, the whole purpose is that man is supposed to be ruling and managing the kingdom of God on the earth in, from the garden of Eden and spread it out to all the surface of the earth. Because man is supposed to create like God creates. No creates. Man is supposed to function like God functions. So man is given the opportunity to start in the kingdom of God and then to be fruitful from that kingdom, then multiply the essence of the kingdom, the glory of the kingdom, and bring about the reality of heaven themselves, just like God does. So that way, because if everything is just ready made, then there will be no functionality for man. Then he's not doing anything because everything is already there. Everything is already all over the place. So what is man doing here? It's just, but he's supposed to be here spreading it. Once, you know, meter or one kilometer at a, at a, you know, at a time. So he's supposed to spread the kingdom of God from the Garden of Eden, and made it to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. And uh, now, so who is man supposed to be on the earth? Just like God is the Lord and God ruling and managing the universe, which is like 500 billion times bigger than the earth. So that God himself is the manager and the Lord and King of the universe. But God, I mean, the, but man that is made in God's image is only given the authority to rule and manage the earth as God manages the universe at, at large. So man, if that 
reign of man on the earth, which is supposed to uh, be reminiscent of God's rule and reign upon the universe because man himself is made to be a copyright or copy carbon copy of God himself. Just like the earth, the heavens, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, uh, the earth in the sense of the kingdom of God, the garden of Eden, is a carbon copy of the kingdom of heaven. So it's like duplicating. It's like me giving birth to a child. When God, when, when God gave birth to his image, which is man, he created a planet for him where he should reign, which is the earth. Uh, so the same way, uh, so man is supposed to originally function like God functions. Man is created to function like a small God or mini God mm -hmm. upon his own universe, which is the earth. So the, that process had just begun in the Garden of Eden when man started by walking the earth because man had actually started walking the earth in the Garden of Eden. He had started this expansion process before the fall came. One of the things he has he managed to do is that he had managed to discover gold. He has managed to discover many precious things in the Garden of Eden. And he had managed to discover rivers, the four rivers. And man had also managed to be able to cultivate the earth because it is God would not allow the grass and the vegetations to grow until man was ready for the cultivation and the management. So since they were growing and the, the, the cultivation was taking place, it means that man was already in charge of the cultivation, cultivation and the management in the garden. And also man had also named the animals, all the animals uh, on the earth. So man was actually functioning already, expanding the kingdom of God from the garden of Eden to the fullness of the earth before the causes, I mean, the causes, I mean, the, the confusion of uh, uh, the, the fall or the temptation came when, uh, you know, serpent came to tempt uh, Eve and Adam. So, so, the... so we are made to reflect God. We are made to be a copy of God. We are made to be, to demonstrate God and to spread the reality of the kingdom of God on the earth. To duplicate heaven on the earth and to manage the earth like God manages the universe. Just, that's just in the short. So after analyzing everything, seeing the chaos, the bombing, the first world war, the second war, the atrocities, the ratings and pillages of soil, the collection of sands, in erecting mountainous buildings, do you think man have succeeded in fulfilling the the objective of God on earth? Yeah, that question you asked may, has just qualified you to be somebody more intelligent than most atheists you will ever listen to. Most atheists will never phrase that question the way you just phrase it now. And most agnostics also. They will not say, as man succeeded, in the assignment that God gave him, they will never mm -hmm. say it like that because they don't know that aspect. They will only tell you that as God not failed. Okay. Because they don't know, they don't see the difference between what God is doing and what God is supposed to do in regards to the earth and what man is supposed to do. They don't seem to know the difference. They just mm -hmm. will tell you, if God is the God of the universe, if he's God, so why is it that, as a God, uh, there is war? Why is it that children die? Why is it that war, all those things, calamities happen on the earth? Where is God? Where are all those things happen? But that itself shows their ignorance. And, and, that, and they are taking their decision and their reasoning is coming from that premise that God is supposed, if he's God, is to blame and is a failure because things are happening. Whereas the wisdom of the question you just asked is that what they, they don't know that aspect because they don't know enough of the Bible to judge like that. So they don't know that God has stepped out. God created the 
planet Earth and put man in it to be the manager of the earth, to rule and reign here. So most of these things that we are talking about, the calamities, the wars, the death, the diseases, and the destructions that are happening on the earth, doesn't have anything to do with God at all. This is a man, this is a man's decision. And it is a man's failure. And that is why I will endeavor to try to answer your question because you, the question came absolutely, absolutely dot on. Has man succeeded and been able to cope with the assignment that God would give to him? No. And that is why when I listen to the form of Christianity that people preach in Africa today, they preach as such that man doesn't have responsibility on the earth. Just pray. Pray to God. Go and beg God to come and do something for us here. Go to church to ask God to come and fix it. Even they are ignorant, even though they go to church. They don't understand the God they believe in. And they don't understand the way he has created the earth to function. So religion is the one that is making the atheists doubt God. And the atheists will be thinking, why are you praying to God? If you are prepared to, to, to him for all these years, 1,000, 2,000 years, and it's not improving anything, and where is he? Either he's dead or he's deaf. And I agree with them. Because he, those, those prayers we are doing, we, either he's deaf or he's dead. But the reason why God will not interfere, interfere or intervene is because he's, you don't, it's not his own obligation. It's not his own duty. It is our duty. So, which means that most of the prayers that we pray as Christians actually is an indication of our own ignorance and irresponsibility. So most Christians that go to church and most of the prayers that we pray is only indicating the fact that we don't get it. We are set are confused as people who claim to believe in God. Because you are not supposed to be praying to God to come and fix the problem of the earth, but you are supposed to step into the arena. You are supposed to step into the uh, court, into the ball court, into the courtroom and be a player. You are supposed to be a player in the affairs of the earth. So, for example, if you want the, earth, the, uh, the, the environment or the ecology to function properly, you need to go and study it. And be good in need to be able to know the laws and the rules and how to manage the earth. We are the ones supposed to be managing the earth. So, let's say, for example, I don't want war to happen. That's why I'm, I must study the reasons for war. And what are the things that bring about this conflict that will lead to war? And what are the ways where I could bring solution and answer to conflict resolution? So we must develop conflict resolution as a science and dedicate ourselves to the prevention of war and conflict. So it's a man's duty rather than God's duty. So when we now say, but there is poverty on the earth and there is hunger and children are dying, well, that's because I'm irresponsible. Or somebody is irresponsible on the earth. Who is supposed to have been, whose responsibility it was supposed to be to manage the distribution of wealth and what on the earth or the creation of wealth or the economic, you know, uh, you know, procedures of the world. So it is the responsibility of man and that's why we cannot leave any sphere of the, uh, of the earth out and say, we cannot go into that area. Why? If you say you cannot go to that area, you are slapping God in the face. Because God has given you charge over the earth to manage it for him. And now you are saying, I cannot go into that area of politics because it is politics and it is bad people who are there. What? So, are you not a man like them? Why can't you go there and fix it and pray to God to give you the energy or the, the understanding and the wisdom? Why, okay, if you say, I don't want to go and do uh, uh, military stuff because military is violent, okay, then you are, li you are responsible. Your irresponsibility or lack of decision has now allowed people who are irresponsible to go into that area and start war. Because you, that is supposed to be a better person, you are not going to take responsibility. Okay. That's bottom because... Uh, so, the are, are you... today okay. in Nigeria... In my country, Africa, Nigeria today, most religious people, we gather their members 
to go to, to come to church to pray for God to bless their country instead of the pastors to be lecturing the people, all the people he has gathered, lecturing them, telling them to go and look for new inventions for economic growth, telling them to go and look for new discoveries for technological explosion, as, uh, uh, you know, explosion of the explosion. Yeah. So, or going to do some, you know, um, communicate communications or to bring about no house, and he's supposed to be telling them and instigating them to go and bring about no house that will manage the earth better and be able to fix every issue and circumstances and challenges that the earth is facing and that we come across. That is what would make us. That is the greatest way of glorifying God, and that is what will make us to be most grateful to God and express to God the fact that we are grateful that he has entrusted into our hands, you know, he has given us so much trust. But when he has given us so much trust and we are not taking it and we are, you know, referring back to him and say, you know, but you come and fix it, we are, you know, we are just spitting in his eyes. So it's, it's, it's the highest level of irresponsibility that churches demonstrate. And it's because of the theology that they have. And the theology that they have is the fact that I am nothing, we are nothing, we are weak, we are just humans that are nobody, we are just like worms or like, uh, you know, things, and then we cannot do anything. But it's not true. And that is why right now the most progressive people in the world are atheists. Why are they the most progressive? Because they are not waiting on God. They are actually more responsible as creation of God, as men, than people who are believing in God. Because they take charge. They take responsibility for the creation. And if they have not taken responsibility for creation, and if everybody were to, supposed to behave like, like the Christians are behaving, we will remain in the old, in the middle, in the old, in the stone age, or in the dark ages. Because we will not do anything. We will be praying to God to come and fix it. Mm. That's an interesting perspective. I'm actually impressed by that because this is what makes you different. Not our pastor will say all this thing. They, they actually will rather depend on some kind of power, celestial power to come down and do this thing. I told my friends often, believers, I said, you don't pray for a rocket to go to the space. The NASA project that they're carrying, you don't pray to do that. If they can send a rocket to the space, you can equally do anything. You know. And somebody was looking for a job, then the next thing they would come to the church. I remember those days when I was in the church, we would receive requests like that. You know, I want to pray for certain people in the church. The young man would come and say, he need prayer to find a job. Then we would just pray. The next Sunday he will come by the same thing. The next Sunday he will come by throughout the whole year. The same repetitive process. And one day I just say, you know, it might not necessarily be prayer. Come, let's see how you organize your CV. Let's see what's wrong with your CV. Probably it's not well written. Probably, maybe you don't even know how to write a CV. And probably you don't know how to present yourself when you go for an interview. So you don't give good impression for. So there are practical stuff that Christians need to understand that not prayer doesn't solve everything that you need to take. This. And then another lady again will come in. She says she will, she will give request. She needs a husband. She's getting so frustrated. She was getting to her thirties and thirty-one. She was so so frustrated. She was trying to look for a husband to go to get married to. They weren't coming in. The next day she decided. She said, "Okay, she will just decide to just have a baby and just any man." But she doesn't want to have a baby with a black man. She says she wants to have a baby with a white man. Okay, and she, she she kept trying to have a baby, and the baby is not coming. So she thought that she was barren medically or fit to to have a child, and she became super frustrated. And then go on with prayers, prayers upon prayers, repetitively throughout the whole day. Then I say, you see, it might not necessarily be the problem of you not finding a man. You might try to cross check yourself, probably your behavior, your comportment, the way you handle some of these men. They come around, the way you treat them. Maybe you don't understand this, this love thing. Maybe you don't understand what really relationship is all about. Because there's no way a man will come into your life. And if you're good, the man will not stay. If you are, you buy material and the man can be able to see this value in you. Because I'm saying this because some men, they don't see it even if it's there. They are so irresponsible that they don't see this value. You have a good man with a very irresponsible man. So it's a situation where we see it daily. But there's no way as a woman, if you're good, that a man, a responsible man comes to you 
he would like to stay. So prayers doesn't really solve everything. That's what Christians need to understand. And I'm really, really impressed with that commentary he just made about. So going back to the example you gave, you said now you put everything entirely on man. You say that. So do you think in your opinion, is there any moment, at least in the history of humanity, that man actually did something that God was impressed with? Do you think, is there any history of humanity, anything at all, any moment, not necessarily recorded in the Bible, is there any moment God was happy with, hmm, he would say, hmm, humans, I'm really impressed with your act because I look back into the history of humanity, I don't never seen anything charming at all. It's just chaos, chaos, chaos upon chaos. I've never seen any age where man is happy, relax and say, yes, we have done something great for humanity. Even with the scientific invention, this this is destruction to humanity. I've seen so many progressive scientific foundings, and the, but they are poisoning our food, they are poisoning our waters, they are making humans become obese and car accident. I saw that I saw recently, just a few hours ago before coming, I saw that there, there's something they call 5G. 5G is a system of the started the, 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 the innovation of of phones. Yeah. Yes, innovation of phones. They started with 1G, 2G, 3G, for now 4G. Then 5G is coming in. They're saying that the, the the innovation we're going to do is going to be even dangerous. That your car can be hijacked. You can have interference, frequency interference. So constantly evolution. Everything that man is doing is leading to his doom. Nothing at all is progressing. So is there any moment at all God sat down and is really proud of humanity? That This this question I'm asking is relating to the questions I asked a few minutes ago. If at all God, human, have succeeded at all in fulfilling the, the, the objective of God. So this question is related to that question. Did, is there any period in human history that man has done anything at all to impress God? Yes. Okay. I think every day. Man is impressing God. Okay. Every day. Every day in history, somebody is doing something that is impressing God. Okay. Every day in history, somebody is doing something that is making God to stand up and applaud. I think that what Mark Zuckerberg has done with Facebook is making mm -hmm. God proud. I think what Bill Gates has done with Microsoft is making God proud. I think the innovation of Steve Jobs is making God proud. I think the innovation of airplane is making God proud. I think the discovery of jets and, you know, scientific discoveries that were all as cars, I think they are making God proud. I think the, the building of cities is making God proud. You see, what I base that on is because the Bible tells us about heaven. And we should understand that the original intent in the mind of God is that the earth will reflect heaven. And the Bible tells us about heaven. What do we see and what picture can we imagine about heaven? Mm -hmm. Heaven is a place of perfection. Heaven is a place that is highly organized and highly functional. Perfectly functioning in excellence. Anytime you do something like that, anytime you move towards excellence, you are making God's heart happy. Because you are duplicating the reality of heaven on earth. The Bible also tells us that in heaven there are no tears, no sorrow, and no pain. So anytime anybody relieves another human being of pains, is making God's heart proud. Anytime anybody is, you know, bringing comfort, demonstrating love by removing the discomfort and bringing uh, comfort and peace and harmony to a people or to a place, God is being proud of that person. Or let's say, uh, the Bible describes to us how heaven looks like. Bible talks about mansions that are exceptionary. Bible talks to us about cities that are perfect to the extent that the roads are so reflective that they are more like, like, like gold, perfection, quality. So when you build a quality house 
or functional city, mm -hmm. like smart cities, where everything is functional, houses, road, everything is perfect, God applauds. Because that is reduplicating the exact thing that God wanted to do here in the first place. God wanted to make the earth to be a reflection of heaven, the perfection of heaven, and the excellence of heaven. So that's why people who keep their members in churches and not sending them to go and build 21st century cities and not sending them to go and build futuristic industries and not sending them to go and create you know, mm -hmm. uh, modern infrastructure, they are working against God. Because God himself came up with those ideas. Those are God's ideas. You know, the futuristic cities are God's ideas. And those are the things we see uh, in heaven. And that's why God said that the will of God and the thing that he wants us to do on earth is to be able to bring the earth, I mean the, the heaven, to the earth. He said, let thy kingdom come to the earth as it is in heaven. For that was the original plan. So whenever people move in that direction, they make the heart of God uh, proud. And that's why God is saying, you know, pray that they, you know, for the manifestation of the sons of God, that will be able to reproduce heaven here on earth. Okay. Okay, so the right. Okay, because the first question was if, if, if man have actually succeeded in fulfilling the, the objective of God is a, is a really interesting perspective to, to consider. So, well, and the man has the, not succeeded because let's say what we have done so far has not eliminated hunger, it has not entirely eliminated uh, conflict and strife and war, it has not eliminated uh, diseases. It has not eliminated sicknesses. De des terres, on t'appelle. Je suis une interview. J'en ai rien à foutre. Éteins ton truc. On s'est fait agresser verbalement par ton collègue. Okay. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Rien à foutre. Éteins. Depuis tout à l'heure, on l'appelle. Il est là. I don't know what happened there. I don't know what's going on with. Uh, with with uh i don't know what's going on over there with innocent does he have a wife or what or who is the woman okay we shouldn't touch it huh we shouldn't go there okay my wife thinks i shouldn't go there uh, whatever happened there we don't know but i think this was a woman shouting at the guy was that not a certain woman there i think it was a woman shouting at uh our atheist. <laughs> well, atheist has got to, I think this guy has got to, he was supposed to be praying to God or he was supposed to believe in God. I think maybe it's time for him to begin to believe in God right now. Maybe God could help him to fix that problem. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, that the, uh, it is man's problem. It is man's problem. <laughs> you know, that's why you need to have a Christian wife. That's why we need to have a Christian wife. A Christian wife, will, I don't think, would do that. But uh, well, I will advise him. I will advise you, innocent. Innocent, maybe the people who are saying you should receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe they are not totally mistaken. <laughs> they will give you a Christian wife on top. Okay? So it's going to be a peaceful life after that. <laughs> So I'm sorry, guys. Let me see some of your uh, comments. Uh, let me see some of your comments. Uh, Singer Holic says, "This heaven you preach about and the Bible talks about. Where is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> we will talk about that when innocent comes. Maybe he will ask me that question." Winnie Ajali says, "Hi, everyone. Please, do we have any distributor of DSS books in Kaduna State, Nigeria?" Thanks for your quick response. Kaduna State, Nigeria is not far from uh, Abuja, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I think that if you get Miss Sister Angela, do you know Sister Angela? Sister Angela used to call here every night, every day, almost, you know, every day. 
And so if you get Sister Angela in Abuja, her name actually is Angel Odinaka. Odinaka, Angel, Angel Odinaka. Angel Odinaka on Facebook. If you get her, she is in of Abuja. I think she has some of my books there. And then also, if you get Shioma, Shioma, she is in Lagos. She is a distributor of my books in Lagos for sure. Uh, okay, who else do we? What else do we have there? Kobla Ali said, "I love DSA with all my heart and soul." Wow, Kobla Ati. Okay, okay. You know what? I, what I would like to advise you to do, Kobla is that you should become like DSA. And the way to become like DSA is not difficult. Just go ahead and, <laughs> and consume as much as DSA's material you could consume and join the mentorship class. You know, I started a mentorship class for, to help people to actually become uh, competent Christians. Because a lot of Christians that we have today, they, they, don't, they are not being taught very well because the church has deceived us for so long. And we don't even have the right understanding of Christianity. So if you, are a Christ, if you are a Christian and you really want to become a more modern Christian, a Christian that will understand the Bible, you want to put your theology in order, you want to know God for yourself, please go and join that mentorship class. And the way to do it is to go to www.sundayadelajablog.com www.sundayadelajablog.com slash uh, mentorship. sundayadelajablog.com slash mentorship. Bring some books from all the books. Yeah. sundayadelajablog.com slash mentorship. sundayadelajablog.com slash mentorship. And then for those of you who want to come to HMT, the way to do it is to uh, also go to sundayadelajablog.com slash visit. Either you want to come to HMT for children or for adults. And also for those people who want, to, uh, uh, who want to join the Nigerian project, it is sundayadelajablog.com slash Nigeria. So, uh, but let me see uh, other comments that I'm having here. Can a man ever make the earth become like heaven? Oh, yeah, that's the assignment. You have to go and listen to my uh, Kingdom series. If you listen to the Kingdom series, you understand uh, the point. Or you, if you write, read my book, Kingdom Driven Life, it will also help you. Okay, let me do some presentation to you guys. Uh, I have some of my uh, books here. I don't know, have you, uh, who has read this book? I would like somebody to come and do a presentation of this book or oh, we have done it already have we done it how to live an effective life how to live an effective life unfortunately many people have life but they don't know how to live it effectively you know for you to learn to live an effective life get this book please and the way to get the book is to write to dsa's books at gmail.com or go to my blog sundaydelajablog.com slash books Another book that will really help us to become who God wants us to be, like I was talking about with uh, Innocent, is Excellence. This book is how to be excellent in everything and how excellence could bring you to the place of elevation that you are dreaming about. This book is how to become great through one instrument alone. How to become great through time conversion. One thing alone, time conversion will make you great. Then this one is to destroy the myth that Christian pastors in Africa are building for their people. This book is called the Work is Better Than Vacation and Labor is Better Than Favor. A lot of people, unfortunately, believe that vacation is better than work, but it's not true. Work is actually better than vacation and labor is better than favor. So don't be looking for favor. Look for, uh, for, for labor. This book here, Where Are the Heroes, Let the Heroes Arise, will help you to become the kind of person that can win the world for God. It's, uh, it's on how to raise personalities. You could become a personality that the history, that history, that will leave the sand, the, 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 the mark of his feet on the history. You can leave your mark on the history. This one here, Stop Working for Uncle Sam. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows what this is now. This is one of the hottest books out there to set you free from working for money or working for a job. 
this is how the principle through which the Europeans build the, the greatest civilization in the world, the Christian civilization. It is called the dignity of labor. This is how they built Europe. All of us must understand what dignity of labor is and we could use it to build our lives and to build our society. In, insulted by ungodliness. Now, ungodliness is everywhere around us and we are the ones to challenge him by being insulted by it and stopping all kind of ungodliness around us. But you cannot do it without becoming a workaholic. You know, we know what is alcoholic, but I'm not talking about being an alcoholic here. I'm talking about being a workaholic. Why you must urgently become a workaholic. Every one of us that wants to leave their mark in history must become a workaholic. You have to work so hard like you're becoming a like, workaholic. People who have been following me know that Pastor Sunday is probably a workaholic. Now, this one is called How to Be in the Here and Now. Now, the, and this is a lot of, this is one of the major reasons why people will never succeed in life. They are always absent minded. They don't live a conscientious, no, no, conscious life. They don't live a conscious life every minute. For, but for you to really be, to rule your world, to rule and reign in your world, you must stop the dreaming and start being in the here and now. Now, this one here, pay close attention to it. Rid yourself of shallow mindedness. You know what that means? You see the brain? Brain here. The picture of the brain. You need to swish it on. Right? For most people, it is off. Their brain is on off. So how do you swish on the brain? How do you make yourself to be intelligent and become a genius? To begin to think. How do you use your thinking faculty? This is what this book will teach you. Read yourself how to get rid of shallow-mindedness. And this one is also to help you to keep your focus. Most people know what, what they, know, they have had the word focus, but they don't know how to keep focus. This is what this book will teach you. And these are the things churches are supposed to be teaching us. Churches are supposed to be teaching us these things, but most churches don't know. I am a person. Am I a personality? Is the name of this one. You could be a human being, but are you a personality? Is, the, is your word counting with you? That's why you should read this book, because it will teach you to not just exist, to, be, to become a personality. This one is one of the hottest books out there, raising the next generation of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. You can do, make history just like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates have made their history and left their mark. You can do the same thing as well. How do you do it? This is what this book will tell you. Now, for the, somebody that is asking, how can we duplicate the kingdom of God on the earth? That's why I wrote this book, The Kingdom Driven Life. It will help you to, bring the, to duplicate on your personal level, not on the church level. You will be able to duplicate the, the kingdom of God on the earth. Next one is called life is an opportunity. Life is an opportunity. Unfortunately, opportunities abide all around us, but most people don't even know about them. They, they let them go and then they begin to complain. This one here is for Christians. Pastor, face your calling is the name of the book. This is what they tell me. They tell me to face my calling and I should stay behind the pulpit. But I said, no, you see the pulpit? We have to bring the pulpit from inside the four walls of the wall of the church and bring it to the main street. This is the street here around. And this is the pulpit. And pulpit in the street. So we have to take the gospel and the kingdom of God outside there to the street and bring the kingdom of God to our spheres of life. This is how to do it. This book here is another uh -huh, memorable book, unbelievable book. How to transform and build a civilized nation. Are you interested in building a great nation for your country? The signs of a healthy society. This is how to build a healthy and civilized society. For those of you who might have financial challenges, this is how to, you can build a secured financial future for yourself. This one is called, No One is Better Than You. If you have not read it, you are missing out a lot. Go and read this book and know that you can be better than anybody out there. Don't eat tomorrow's food today. This is to teach you the principles of savings and investment. Now, this one says when to pray, when not to pray, when to stop praying. Do you? Can you believe it? You don't just become religious and be praying, 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 praying all the time. But you must know when to pray, when not to pray, and when to stop praying. And this one is when, where there is problem, there is money. 
If you understand this principle, you begin to look for problems because problems will begin to be converted to money automatically for you. Look at this one. This is my favorite book. It's called The Law of Difference. This is how to see difference and convert difference and turn difference into your wealth. Who am I? Why am I here? And this is my most popular book right now. It helps you to discover who you are and why God sent you to the earth. The essence and value of life. Can you believe it? Do you know that you have life? We know the word life, but do you know the essence of it? Why life? Why? why? The essence of life and the value of it? This is the book that would open your eyes to the reality of life, what life is all about. This one is how to win in life. Have you ever thought about it? Why is it that some people succeed in life and some people don't? Well, this is the secret of four there. Another one is what to do with your time. Some people don't know what to do on a daily basis. They go and be watching movies and uh, cinema and they are wasting their lives. No, you don't need to. This book has brought the solution. You will know exactly what to do with your life on a daily basis. Look at this one. Have you, been able, have you ever faced some trials, some crises, some tribulations? Well, your greatness is proportional to your trials, to your crises and tribulations. So if you will be able to learn how to embrace trials, crises, tribulations, and convert them, you, you can use them to propel yourself into your destiny. Some of us have lost so many years, especially in religion. This is why I wrote this book, How to Regain Your Lost Years. Especially for those who have lost many years into religion, you can regain it and reclaim it. One of my most popular books is this one, Money Won't Make You Rich. Everybody who has read it, they have said it is one of the best books they have ever read. This is how I made, this is what I used to make 200 millionaires. The Mountain of Ignorance, that is our problem in Africa. Ignorance, ignorance has become a mountain and we must learn to surmount them. And if we don't learn what it is, we will not be able to remove it from our land. Seven tips to self-fulfillment in life. Everybody can be fulfilled just using these seven tips. If you get these seven tips right, you'll become anything you want to be. The creative and innovative power of a genius. The creative and innovative power of a genius. Well, this is uh, how to become a genius, how to become creative and innovative. All of us can be, so embrace that. Discover the source of your latent energy. You have some energy in you, but they are lying down there latent or latent. You know, they are you know, lying down there idle. You need to know, know how to discover and activate them. For you who have children, if you have children, this is your solution. How to raise great children. How to create core values in a child. These are how, this, this is a book of, about values, how to create them in a child. Look at this one, the veritable source of energy. You have the creative and the power of God in you that you could use to become anything. This is how to discover that power here. Problems, your shortcut to prominence. This is how to convert problems and make it to become your uh, springboard to prominence. A lot of people are fear, afraid of death. Fear is the number one, uh, death, fear of death is the number one fear that everybody faces in life. That fear could be, you will begin to thank God for death after you read this book. Church Shift, that's my first book, my first international book. And it's, some people think it's the greatest book that they have ever read. So you might want to read this book. Poverty Mindset versus Abundance Mindset, you know. How do you think? Have you renewed your mind yet? Well, this is the book that will help you. How Africans brought civilization to Europe. Have you read it? If not, you need to read it, especially if you're an African. You will be proud. You will begin to run about the city and thanking God that you're an African. Why losing your job is the best thing that could happen to you? Have you, if you have lost your job, rejoice. Even if you have not lost it, just read this book so that in any case, you will know what to do. 
Why am I unlucky? You know, a lot of times we discover that bad things keep on happening to us. Well, discover the reason in this book. This one is called Finding Answers to Why Good People Die Tragic and Early Death. It's the book I wrote about my friend, Miles Monroe, but it will help you to find answers to why good death people die early or tragic death. This is one of the most powerful books you will ever read. A visionless life is a meaningless life. How to live on a daily basis by vision. How to live a vision life, a visionful life. You know, so, you know, if you need to learn to embrace vision and be able to live a purposeful life on a daily basis. Monoculturalism, the danger of monoculturalism. You don't live among your own people only. Learn from the diversity of the world. This is how to honor every culture, every person, every individual. Now, these are books on Nigeria. Nigeria and the Leadership Question, one of my best books on Nigeria. You need to know how to resolve the problem in Nigeria. Not just Nigeria, any country you belong to. Nigeria Economy, The Way Forward is the name of this one. This is the book that will be able to resolve Nigeria's economic problem. How the Nigeria economy can overtake the American economy is this one. Can you believe it? It's not fantastic. When you read it, you'll begin to believe it. How to make Nigeria the greatest country in the world. This is another great book that you be. Somebody just read it and they say, they are so happy that they are Nigerians. And uh, you begin to rejoice. This one is under all. Only God can save Nigeria. What a myth. It's a myth to say only God can save Nigeria. We need to take responsibility. Well, those are the books I have here. Okay. Let me see what you people are writing. By the way, you can read all these books for free. You can read all these books for free when, if you are registered on, uh, uh, on Kindle Unlimited, on Amazon. So you can read all the books for free. But if you are not registered on Amazon, you can buy them on Amazon. But if you cannot buy them on Amazon or they are too expensive for you, you can write to my office, dssbooks at, uh, dssbooks at gmail.com. dssbooks at gmail.com. Well, I don't think Innocent is coming back today again, no. Uh, so, uh, I think we have to wait for Innocent next Sunday, I suppose. Uh, so, I'll be back in the next 40 minutes. In the next 40 minutes, we'll continue the series on love. I'm sorry for Innocent. Innocent, uh, uh, is it what they say? Uh, my, uh, uh, my sympathy goes out with you to you. Uh, I don't know what how to, you say that, but uh, I just wanted to say that our support and prayers are with you. I don't know whatever happened there, but uh, be strong, bro. We are with you. We love you, and uh, God is going to give you an answer. Don't mind what my joke about getting a Christian wife, but you know, I'm just trying to do something creative in this situation that we found ourselves. So, but uh, we are with you. Take heart, my bro. God bless. See you people later. Peace.